I wish I could learn some Ukrainian, but I'm never here long enough. <laughs> so, Allah was, you were trying last time, as I remember, to teach me a few words. Anyway, um, thank you very much, Dean Aksamitna, for introducing me and uh, for all those who organized this uh, conference, but mainly from Ukraine, right? Uh, but anyway, it's great that they we're having a debate about public sociology here in Ukraine. Um, I've, I come here, it's my, I guess it's my third visit uh, to the Mahira Academy. And uh, so we've had conversations about public sociology before uh, when I've been here. And so I think last time we thought it would be fun to have a conference. It's my, I guess my last visit on this sort of... On the, under the auspices of, of the Shorash Foundation. Um, so, uh, uh, and I've been very much inspired actually. I've been talking to, to a number of people here who do lots of interesting public sociology, both younger and older generations. And so, um, what I'm going to do today is perhaps uh, give an overview of what I think are the problems of doing public sociology. It turns out that public sociology is not easy. People think, aha, public sociology, that is presenting sociology to bigger audiences, wider audiences. Professor Gorbachev knows all about this, uh, uh, as many of you here do, but it's actually, to do it seriously takes a lot of time, patience, effort, many tears. And uh, you, need, you need to be very resilient to do this um, effectively. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is talk about some of the dilemmas of public sociology. Am I, is, it, is, is my English, is it okay? People understand me? <laughs> all right, all right, I think I'll take this thing off. Okay, so I'm supposed to talk for how long? 50 well, minutes. 50 minutes, okay, so exactly 11 o'clock. And then we have some time for questions. But if I start earlier, we have more time for end more questions. Okay. All right. All right. Public sociology. Here's public sociology. Spielner. Ha ha. Yes. Ah, uh, it's, it's actually very inspiring. Public sociology. This, I mean, this, I mean, this, this involves ask, you know, Vladimir or Anastasia, they know that this takes a lot of time and effort and uh, their savings. Um, so this is a magazine that brings sociology from actually different places in the world to different audiences around Ukraine. Volodymyr tells me that actually he takes this in his bag and goes around the country and actually has discussions with people about the content of this magazine with different audiences. They do something similar in Portugal. This is public sociology in the sense that it takes sociology to audiences beyond the academy, academia. Ah, interesting. Yes. So that essentially is what public sociology is, bringing sociology into a conversation with audiences beyond sociology. What's the big deal? What's, what's so problematic? What's, isn't this obvious? Well, in many countries, this is very controversial. It's amazing. It's very controversial. In my own country, where I, well, my country, my, where I live at any rate, the United States of America, very controversial. I am evil if I, I'm the evangelist of public sociology, and I am, my colleagues are very suspicious of what I do, or what I propose other people should do. So, what's the problem? Well, what is public sociology? Well, public sociology, in a sense, is taking sociology to wider audiences. It has two sides, public sociology. So, essentially, I think that sociology cannot survive cannot survive if it doesn't go public. If we spend all our time talking to one another, just one another, then sociology will wither away, will disappear. 
And so I think it's essential in this world in which everything has to deliver some sort of financial reward, it's important for sociology to have a public outside the academic. So that is one side. And on the other side, I think soci not only does sociology require it to be projected broadly, its vigor, its development, its energy will depend upon discussions with wider audiences. So sociology needs to be public. But I think, and perhaps this is more controversial, publics need sociology. I think we're living in a time in the world where economics rules and a situation in which economics rules in such a way as to destroy society. And I think it's absolutely crucial that society begin to develop a consciousness of itself that sociologists can provide. That sociology will represent the resistance to the commodification of everything in our lives. And this is, this is true, not just in Ukraine, it's true all over the world that we are find ourselves commodifying education, commodifying politics, commodifying finance and money. This is, a, this is the world in which we live. Sociology is the, a singular force amongst others that will resist this commodification. So I think society needs sociology and sociology needs society. Interdependence. Interdependence. Yes. But, but that interdependence is very problematic and difficult because when sociologists talk to publics, they are accountable to publics, but when they talk, when sociologists talk to one another, they're accountable to peers. So professional sociology and public sociology are often in tension. When we are professional sociologists writing articles in journals, sometimes it's even in English. We won't go the Russian road, leave that aside, or the Ukrainian road, but in English. I mean, no publics can read. Most publics can't even read English in most countries in the world. So the professional sociology speaks a language that is often inaccessible to publics. So there's already a tension between the professional world and the world of public sociology. And then, Often, one thinks of going public in a way that is not public sociology, it's what I call policy sociology. So, the institute here was the Kiev International Institute of Comparative so International Sociology. Have I got it right, Professor Panyato? Uh, Kiev International Institute of Sociology. Kiev International Institute of Sociology, situated in the department here in Mahila, actually, as far as I understand, establishes a sort of a basis for sociology in a contractual way. It actually delivers services and is paid for those services as a contractual relationship. That's what I call policy sociology. We need policy sociology because without affecting policies, there's no point often in doing public sociology. But it also has problems because if you start receiving payment for what you do, then you are very easily captured by the people who are paying you. And, uh, and Professor Panyata has given me many stories, and Professor Kamelko too, of, of the problems of actually doing policy sociology, of being captured by one's clients. But policy sociology is different from public sociology because policy sociology is, in a sense, in a sense, a clientelistic relationship, whereas public sociology is a conversation, a conversation between sociologists and publics. Two ways, yes. The distinction is often hard to make in practice, but the analytical distinction is important. So that's. So that's two types, the public, the policy, the professional, and the professional takes place in departments, and the professional itself is internally divided in many ways. After all, 
We are on the one hand, we are teachers, and on the other hand, we are researchers. There's always a tension between the two, and how much time one should spend on each. Yeah. So there's tensions within each, between them, and then there is a fourth type of sociology. Yes. What I call critical sociology. The sort of the heart of sociology. The critical sociology is the sociology that examines the foundations of sociology, the value foundations, the methodological foundations, the philosophical foundations, the theoretical foundations of professional sociology. I don't know if there are well-known Ukrainian sociologists who specialize in critical sociology. But in a sense, all of us are critical sociologists in the sense that we are continually reflecting on the foundations of our work. Yes. But you know, the critical sociologists are not liked by the professional ones. The professional ones want to get on with the work, want to get on with the research. They don't want to have their foundations, their assumptions continually being questioned. So there is a tension. There is a tension there between the critical and the professional. Yeah. Well, all right. That gives you a little bit of an idea. I think of sociology having a division of labor, and there are these four types of sociology. But I just talked about the sociology's internal organization. But when we talk about public sociology, we are thinking about the way sociology transmits itself into a world beyond the academy. So we have to think also of the political field within which sociology acts. And this political field looks different in different places at different times. And I think it's essential for us, if we are to be effective public sociologists, to understand the political field in which we operate. And different countries, there is different space for organizing public sociology in a political space. In some countries, it's more, the media is freer. In other countries, the media is less free. In some countries, we have a strong civil society. In other countries, a weak one. So I think we have to map, as sociologists, we have to map the political field that we want to engage with as public sociologists. We do it intuitively, but I think we have to do it explicitly. And then finally, we have the academic field, we have the political field, we have to think of the intersection of the political and the, and, and the academic field. How do they intersect? To what extent has the academic field autonomy from the political field? These are big and very sensitive questions, but we have to examine them sociologically. So, for example, when the Center for Visual Culture was closed down in Mahila, we can moan and groan and complain and argue and demonstrate and protest and whatever, but we have to also examine sociologically why this happened and in what way this reflects the relationship between the political field and the academic field. I believe the person who shut it down is in this, on this floor down at the end of the corridor. I mean, so what, 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 were the, what, were the, what was going through that person? Kvit, 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 is that his name? <laughs> Chancellor Kvit. Uh, what's, what's his actual status? Well, the president. President, okay. President. I mean, so why did he shut it down? Fascinating question. So it, it, it's an it's, it's a, it's a interesting, interesting issue that we, and that's just one example of many examples. Professor Golomarka uh, actually was telling me when I was here last time was at the time when the Secret Service was, I don't know if they still are, investigating sociologists. Yes. So what was that about? We have to understand these political issues if we are going to be effective public sociologists. We have to understand the terrain on, on which we, and I can give you lots of examples from the United States and from every other country of the problematic relationship between politics and academia. And it's going to intensify. It's going to intensify over time. All right, that's my introduction. That was a long one. Ten minutes. Now, I'm going to try and talk about these issues systematically now. And so when, 
When American sociologists, where's my thing? Oh. I had it a minute ago. No, that's not. I want to have to have mine. No, 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 I broke one. It was with me a second ago. No? Okay, does this work? This is, this is my uh, recorder. Oh, it's your recorder. Yeah, I'm sociology. <laughs> I will spread the word. Okay, very good. All right. I don't know where it is. I just had it. Does anybody see it? Perhaps I put it in my pocket. No. All right. All right. My uh, my happy servant. Okay, very good. So let's go. Okay, now go on more. See, I don't like this. Go more, 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 more. Okay. So, there are two questions, two questions we have to ask that sociologists are reluctant to ask. Two questions. And the first question is, who are we producing knowledge for? Knowledge for whom? Knowledge for whom? Are we talking to ourselves, an academic audience or an extra academic audience? The second question, knowledge for what? This is a bit more problematic. But essentially, are we producing knowledge to solve problems and puzzles? Are we concerned with means for a given end? Or are we concerned with a discussion of the ends of society, the goals of society, the values of society? Two very different questions. Knowledge for whom and knowledge for what? So knowledge for what is, is, a, is an old distinction that Max Weber used between instrumental rationality and value rationality. It's a distinction that was central to the Frankfurt School. It is this idea, are we always obsessed with the most efficient means for a given end, or are we going to discuss the ends, the goals of society? So, you know, the beauty of this is it's a two-by-two two table. Now, the American sociologists following the lead of Talcott Parsons and I should probably say Pitrim Sorokin, love two by two tables. They like to reduce the world to two by two tables, which is what I've done. Okay, fill the boxes for me. And basically, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but essentially, we have professional and policy sociology. It's what I call instrumental knowledge. Policy sociology is concerned with solving problems defined by some client. Now usually that client, whether it be a government agency, an economic corporation, or a trade union, they already know the answer to the problem. What we have to do is legitimate, justify that answer, give it scientific kudos. That's often what actually happens. But anyway, policy sociology is this idea of solving problems defined by clients. Professional sociology is solving puzzles in research programs. So if we have a research program in political sociology or economic sociology, there are certain puzzles emerge. Today, for example, economic, economic sociology is interested in the conditions of the existence of markets and how they continue to expand. It's a puzzle that is established by the Framework of economic sociology. Yes. Feminist sociology has always been interested in the question of how it is that women are, find themselves in a subordinate position to men. Many different answers are given, and the idea is to, in a sense, to adjudicate between these different answers and to build a research program. So that's the professional sociology, solving puzzles in research programs. But then there is the reflexive knowledge, knowledge that is concerned with discussion goals and values. And on the one hand, we have critical sociology, which discusses sociologists, academics, discussing with one another the philosophical, methodological, theoretical assumptions of their research programs. And then public sociology is discussing, sociology is discussing with publics, the values and direction of society. That's it. Four types of sociology. The division of sociological labor. 
Yeah. So, now, we can talk a lot about this. In fact, I could spend the next week talking about this two by two table and how it appears in different ways in different places. And how the relations among these four sociologies is a relation of domination. But let me stress essentially, since this is about the dilemmas, the contradictions in here in this table. On the one hand, we've talked about the professional and the public. The professional sociologists are doing research, they are accountable to whom? Who evaluates their work? Fellow sociologists, peers, for journals. Whereas the public sociologist is accountable to publics. The professional sociologist is, has, sociology is inaccessible to anybody but sociologists. I don't know if any of you spent any time looking, for example, at the American Sociological Review. It's incomprehensible to most sociologists, never mind publics. So, You've got a real tension here between a professional sociology and a public sociology, and yet they're interdependent. You can't have a really vibrant professional sociology unless it's responsive to a public sociology, and there's no public sociology if there's no professional sociology. There's no sociology if there's no professional sociology. Public sociology's identity comes from what professional sociologists discover, interdependence and antagonism. Policy and public sociology, equally interdependent and antagonistic. The public sociologist is concerned with discussing with wider society values that are assumed by the policy sociologist. In a sense, the public sociologist is often the conscience of the policy sociologist. But when a public sociologist goes and works with a community, Then, that community is not just happy discussing with sociologists about the significance of their particular problems, but it wants those problems to be solved. So communities push the public sociologist to become a policy sociologist. There's always that pressure to deliver, to deliver some real change for the communities one interacts with. Yes. And of course the professional and the critical you always need critical sociology to give energy to professional sociology, but professional sociology therefore needs critical sociology. But it also hates critical sociology, because critical sociology is always snapping at its heels, always engaging in a disruption of life with taken for granted assumptions, questions of the side. All right, I'm just suggesting a little bit about the dilemmas internal to this division of labor. But we have to actually constitute this division of labor as a field. A field, an academic field, is inserted into the wider society. So how do we think about how sociology, with its division of labor, is inserted into the wider society? Okay, well, we'll Okay, all right. Here's the academic field. So now, when we talk about field in the world, we turn from boxes to circles. Okay. So what we see is that each of these types of sociology has a relationship to the world beyond. And there's just go on, next one. So the first, let's talk about public sociology. Yeah. Public sociology. Oh. Well, there are two types of public sociology. <coughs> what I call traditional. And we'll get the traditional public sociologist is the sociologist who spends time writing in newspapers, who spends time on television. I suspect, Professor Golovaka, you spend a lot of time on television and writing in newspapers. Yeah, I, I, I will. Mitten, Professor Oxamitten seems to agree with that. Yes, you probably do too. All these bleeding figures. Yes, you were going to say something. Yes. What were you going to say, sorry? I interrupted you. Uh, you no, 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 no. When was the last time you were on television? Uh, yes. Do you remember? The well, last time you wrote an article. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Oh, yes. What did you talk about? I, about the problem of international 
situation with Ukraine, we European association. Uh huh. Yes. Uh huh. It affects yeah. everybody. Yeah. European yeah. Union. Yes. Yeah. A central problem. Yeah. Yeah. And what do sociologists have to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> What do they say? No. Uh -oh. Lots of different things. No. The main idea, if you want to be a member of association, you have uh, to maintain the various norms of this association. Brilliant sociological analysis. Yeah. You have to recognize the assumptions, the values, the norms of that. So you have to participate in that community. But the public was not completely satisfied. <laughs> the public wants what? The public, uh, audience, and uh, journalists and politics. They want what? They want immediate benefits. They have different opinions. Uh -huh. And it uh, really is dangerous for the uh, His opinion and my opinion. Who is right? Uh -huh. If I am a professional sociologist, I am right. If I am public sociologist, who knows? Maybe politics. Maybe. Ah, this is very good. <laughs> very good. That's right. So it's very important to think about the, the legitimacy we have in the public sphere. Oh, yes. Does our expertise mean anything? What does a sociologist mean in the real world? Yes. If I am academic sociologist, I am a bot. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I am public sociologist. You're just like I anybody else. But we are. Better who is what? Right. But, you see, I think a public sociologist's role is to generate discussion, not solutions. That's the policy sociologist. So you're generating discussion, so that's very good. Uh-huh, yes. If discussion is a goal, yeah. I, if result is a goal. Right, well, that's the difference between the policy and the public. Yes, very good. All right. So, right, so that's, that's an example of what I call traditional public sociology, how we normally think of sociologists. Going to the media, television, newspapers, radio, and try and develop discussion about basic issues in society, as opposed to an organic public sociology, where the sociologist has an unmediated relationship to the public. That is, has a direct face-to-face -face relationship between the sociologist and a community, whether it be trade unions, or whether it be uh, neighborhood associations, or whether it be some municipal council. It is the sociologist having direct relationship. That's what I call it organic public sociology. And then there are combinations of the two. For example, Anastasia, when you, talk, when you produce a film about plant closures, you work very closely with the workers of the plant. And then you make a film that goes public. So it's organic and traditional. But anyway, there are these two types of sociolo public sociology. The organic is, in a sense, in a, more, a less protected relationship to, to, to publics because they have to interact directly with them. Yes, all right, very good, very good, very good. Let's move on. Now, we can also look at policy sociology. It too is divided internally. There is policy sociology that is a responsive character. You run this survey, market research. You run a survey to see how, whether people want to buy a particular soap or cigarettes or whatever, and you get paid for it. That is, in a sense, sponsored policy sociology. But there's also advocacy. Advocacy policy sociology in which you have a plan an idea of how to eliminate poverty, of how to solve the language question in Ukraine. You have an idea and then you seek out various audiences to try and convince them that your plan, your solution, is the right one. So the advocacy policy sociology has more autonomy. The advocacy has more autonomy from the client and the sponsored policy sociology. Let's go on. Yeah. We can do the same with professional sociology, divided between teaching on the one hand and research on the other. Teaching, in my view, is a sense, a process of being accountable, accountable to students. There's a dialogue between teacher and taught. Whereas the whole idea of research is much more a community of researchers talking to one another. And that, of course, again, is a tension 
There's a tension between the two, and not just in terms of the amount of time you allocate to each. Go on, next. And finally, critical sociology. Well, on the one hand, critical sociology is a, is a criticism of the foundations of professional sociology. But on the other hand, it is also transmitting that critique to the wider society. Critical sociology is not just about criticizing the discipline, it is also about criticizing the foundations of the society in which we live. And therefore, in a sense, is linked to public sociology. So very quickly, we can see how each of these four types of sociology is internally divided, and there is tensions within each four types, as well as tensions between the four types. How there is antagonistic interdependence. Antagonistic interdependence governing all four types, the relations in within and between. OK. Now we get to the fun part. We have, if so far as we're talking about public sociology, we have to think about the world in which we are organizing the conversation. We have to think of the political field. So we need to have a political sociology that will help us understand the conditions of public sociology. OK, next. And the end. And again, yes, that's my picture of the state, government, state, lots of triangles, hierarchies. Next, that is the economy. <laughs> and we, those are the big players in any political field. But there is a third player. Yes. Oh, no. That's a player. Now, the moon, the moon, the moon is basically, what's the moon? What do you think those two things are? <laughs> well, that's probably a good sign that you don't know. But it, it, they're the political parties. Political parties, you know, they're sort of, you know, hanging in there of, of more or less significance. The real action often is taking place in the state, but there are these political parties that are engaged in competition. And um, next one, I'm not in the, uh, yes, there is civil society. Thank you, Professor Kumarko. Yes, civil society. Well, they look pretty happy, some of them, and some of them look very unhappy, notice. There's misery and happiness. Yes, anyway, so those are the organizations, institutions, associations, and civil society, neither part of the state nor part of the economy, linked often to political parties, yes. And then there's one fourth element to this political sociology, and that is, yes, which is what? Huh? Media. Media, very good. And media take place in the what they call it? Well, the public sphere, thank you, Elena. Yes, the public sphere. And I don't know if I've really represented it, but basically I see the public sphere, that is where conversations take place in the media, in the cafes, in the kitchen. Anyway, where, the pub, where conversation takes place, but particularly outside the private sphere, as I say, in the media, in Parliament, um, that is the public sphere, and that has as its foundation civil society. So these are the elements, I would say, of a political field. Now it gets interesting. Yes, Honor, yeah. Now the economy often starts shaping the civil society, sometimes actually colonizes civil society, conquers civil society, sometimes even destroys civil society. Go on. And the state often also has a relationship of antagonism as well as interdependence with civil society and the public sphere. And finally, there is a very close collaboration between state and economy, between state and capital. And that close relationship is intensifying all over the world. One of the characteristics of the world in which we live, the era in which we live now, is the increased collaboration of state and economy against civil society, against the public sphere, everywhere. 
And that is why sociology is important, because sociology is the standpoint of civil society. It is the standpoint of civil society. And with civil society, the fate of sociology is sealed. So as civil society disappears, sociology disappears. We have an interest in building up civil society and our communication with civil society. We have an interest, therefore, in public sociology. All right, that's the political field. Now, that political field actually, of course, looks different. Different places, different times. This would, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, this would look very different in the Ukraine from what it does today. Um, but we have to map, we have to map this political field if we want to understand, if we want to understand the place of public sociology and the possibilities of public sociology. Okay, move on. So, now, the question is this. What is the relationship between the political field and the academic field? Well, they overlap. When you're a public sociologist, you are on the one hand, you're accountable to the field, to the academic field, but on the other hand, you find yourself inserted into a political field, and therefore there is this incredible tension between the two. Between the two. Yeah. And Sometimes, professional sociologists who are frightened of what? Professional sociologists are frightened that public sociology will delegitimate, will delegitimate their work. Professional sociologists are worried that public sociologists will seem to be politicizing sociology, will be delegitimating their scientific objectivity. Ah. And that is inevitable because, in a sense, the public sociologist has to participate in the political sphere. There's no way out. The question is, to what extent is that public sociologist accountable to the political sphere as opposed to the academic sphere? But you can see why the professional sociologist is worried. Because their standing rests on what? On their scientificity, their objectivity. And there we have public sociologists so sort of dabbling in the political sphere, trying to influence the world, necessarily involving themselves in politics. So that my colleagues who dislike the idea of public sociology, they say, oh, this is a form of political activism. Well, you know, there's a series of, there's a series of videos, I should mention this, that I've been involved in producing over the last semester of public sociologists around the world is on the International Sociological Association website. And indeed, some of those public, public sociologists do say that they're activists. Walden Bellow, very famous sociologist from the Philippines, says, I am an activist! Word. You know, that's, I, 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 so that's already for professional sociologists what they fear the most. They fear the most. And the policy sociologists don't like it either. Because the policy sociologists, what do they have? They have the credential, the credential of the scientific sociologists. And when somebody starts dabbling in politics, their neutrality evaporates. Yes. So this is really a dilemma. And that dilemma has to be understood in relationship, in the relation of the political field to the academic field. We must get away from this sort of polemical arguing and understand what it means to be a public sociologist in terms of the relationships between these fields. Yeah. And we can conceive of these relations in different ways. So, go on the next one. Beautiful. <laughs> so you can see in this case, the political field sort of moves away from the academic field. And in a sense, gives the academic field more autonomy, intervenes less. And the problem is what? Is now that the academic field is more autonomous, it has, of course, less influence because it's removed from the political field. That's the dilemma here. United States, hang on, let me say this. I remember when I was a young, girl, young boy, 30 years ago, um, and Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who subsequently became president of Brazil, came to my university, University of California, Berkeley, and he gave these wonderful lectures, brilliant lecturer, sociologist. 
And he would always laugh at the American sociologists who spend all their time writing papers and exchanging papers with one another. And nobody reads them except for the five people, you know? Today, if you write something in, I don't know, American Journal of Sociology, if you five people you know, sort of recognize you've written it, you're lucky, you know? And he would laugh at us all exchanging papers because in Brazil, in Brazil at that time, still under the dictatorship, if you write anything, of a critical character, you end up in prison. So, there is a real contrast, because in Brazil, the political and the economic, academic field are much more intertwined. So what you say sociologically has immediate political reverberations, immediately. Yes. So, back to that situation, and the next one. Uh -huh. You should, the elder generation here might recognize this picture. This is the picture in the Soviet Union, where the academic field is almost totally enveloped by the political field. So anything you do in sociology becomes political. When I read from the United States of America, read Soviet sociology, I think, ooh, this is boring, this is uninteresting. But I'm missing the context within which it was written. And everything written had a political significance and meaning because the academic field was colonized, dominated, overrun by the political field. Yeah. Okay. Let's go on. So back. So another way of looking at this picture, I'm not, I couldn't, I can't get this intersection as a sort of different color. I've been trying all morning, but it didn't work. But anyway, the point is, in this, in this picture, we see the political field is not dominating that sector, but it's actually the academic field, in a sense, has greater strength. Has greater strength, in a sense, in this situation, you might say, which is a very unusual situation, in which the academic field actually sort of dominates the intersectional part of the political field. Why don't you go to the next one? And more likely is that you have the two, again, separate. And I say the problem with the separation of the two, which we all love to have our academic autonomy, but that academic autonomy can often go along with declining influence and irrelevance. All right. So, let me summarize what I've said. That doing Public sociology is difficult and fraught with lots of dilemmas. First, public sociology has to be seen in relationship to those three other types of sociology in the discipline. And that discipline looks different in different places at different times. And I could spend weeks talking to you about what it looks like in the Philippines or in Brazil or in South Africa or in Denmark or in Sweden, and it's different. So, but the point is you have to look at public sociology in relationship to these other types of knowledge. And that relationship is a relationship of antagonistic interdependence. That's the first point. The second point is that within each type of knowledge there are tensions between the organic and the traditional, between the advoc advocacy and the sponsor, between teaching and research, between societal critique and disciplinary critique. There are tensions within each that we have to recognize and we have to deal with and resolve in some way or another. But then, when we talk about public sociology, we also have to think about the political field in which we operate. To what extent is the public sphere accessible to sociologists? Or to what extent does one have to spend a lot of time working with communities, which is a much more invisible form of public sociology? We have to understand the political field in terms of the possibilities and potentialities of public sociology. Yeah. So we have to do, use our professional sociology to understand the conditions under which we operate as public sociologists. And finally, we have to understand the intersection of the academic and the political fields. And this too will vary from country to country and from time to time from era to era. So these create the foundations of the dilemmas of public sociology. 
And I think to understand those dilemmas, we have got to be good sociologists. We have to be good sociologists to understand those dilemmas and the possible ways of resolving them. Yeah. But I end by saying that, yes, where I began, we're living in an era, they call it neoliberalism, I call it third wave marketization, in which state and economy are collaborating in the destruction of civil society and sociologists interests, humanity's interests are the same. Sociologists interests and humanity is in sustaining an autonomous society that keeps at distance state and economy. And so our interests are indeed in bolstering civil society. It is the interest of us as sociologists and that is why public sociology is so important, because it is precisely that the engagement of the sociologists with civil society that will sustain or help to sustain or contribute to the sustaining of civil society. So I end by saying how important public sociology is, and if it is so important, how we as sociologists must examine the context within which we operate. We need, in a sense, a reflexive a reflexive sociology in which we understand the conditions under which we operate. Okie dokie, I will end there. And now we can have some questions before we have the round, huge round table. Okay, so, yes, Yuri. Uh, I have three related questions. Three related <laughs> questions. Could you please command on the new civic sociology? Uh, no. Why did you come for Yuri to, to, to harass me with my no, no. Very good. He, he actually claimed that uh, this division between, sharp division between professional and public sociology exists only in the United States, and this is a problem of U US academia. Uh, so, what is the basic difference between his view of civic sociology and your view of public sociology? Uh, second question is uh, you uh, now sketched briefly the problem of existence of public sociology within a uh, scientific field as a science. So, there are re really severe limitations of public sociology staying science. And in your paper, in responding to critics, you draw your own branch and you show those limitations. But this is not pro problem just limitations, but plausibility of public sociology. Whether public sociology uh, is possible as science, staying as science. And the third uh, question. So nobody would contend with, uh, with your statement that sociology needs to demonstrate its public value. And public sociology basically is aimed to demonstrate the public value of sociological knowledge. But what is the exact way of doing this? Uh, and answering these questions, uh, we can answer knowledge for whom and for what. If civil society, if state and market would need sociological knowledge, it would help, uh, it would have value. If they don't need, the value uh, would be lower. So what, what is your opinion? Hmm. Hmm. Uh -huh. Well, you should better ask Loïc Bacon what's the difference between civic and public sociology. I have no idea. Loïc is correct, Bacon. Loïc Bacon is correct. He's a colleague of mine at Berkeley. Um, uh, and uh, for those who don't know, he was, I suppose, Bourdieu's closest disciple. Um, but Loïc is correct in saying that the United States is very specific. And indeed, it's very true. In a sense, the, the very notion of public sociology was invented in the United States by C. Wright Mills in Sociological Imagination in 1959. And basically, it was an attempt to recognize that sociology in the United States is very professional. And Cardoso, in his story, was saying the same thing. But professional and largely irrelevant. I mean, it doesn't have a huge impact. Um, so Loic is saying, well, you know, in the United States there is a separation of the discipline from the political field. And of course, he would claim that in France it's different. 
France is a very complicated story, and there are at the pinnacle of the French Academy people who are really intellectuals who engage with, like film stars in the United States, who actually, like Bourdieu, who are actually very notable public intellectuals and have a huge influence on the discussion in politics. So indeed, the United States and France are very different. So, and I have no disagreement with him on that, and I spent a lot of my time distinguishing between public sociology as it looks in different places, looking at the disciplines it sees in different ways. So, I think that basically, uh, yes, I don't think, yes, it, 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 this is a product of the politics of the academic field itself, and uh, which I don't need to divide. But I don't, I don't think there's any clear distinction between what he calls civic and what I call public. No, right. Public sociology is a science. I don't think that public sociology is a science. What is a science is sociology. The professional sociology is a science. Public sociology is not a science. Public sociology is a conversation of the products of the science with broader publics. Publics have their own sociology, if you will. Their common sense world, the view of the world. And it's a, 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 what we are engaged with is a conversation between the common sense world of the public and the scientific sociology on the other. And to what extent does each influence the other? So it's, I'm not saying that public sociology is a science. Sociology is a science. And we'll, I'm committed to that idea. Now, I don't know. I can't quite understand the third question. How does public sociology become public? I mean, I thought this was what I was talking about when I... How to demonstrate public value in sociology? To whom? To the state, to the market. Well, we demonstrate by doing public sociology. We demonstrate it not by just spending our time in academia talking to one another, but we do it by taking the sociology into the public world and having conversations, and having conversations with people who disagree with us. Most none of public sociology is conversating with sociologists and others who we know already will agree with us. By the same political views, the challenge is, is to actually have conversation with people who disagree with us, and that's very difficult. But that is what we have to do. And so I think that is how public, how we will demonstrate the value of sociology is not by sitting tight in academia, but by taking sociology out. And of course, we have many good examples of that here in this room. So, yes, public sociology will only demonstrate its value if it goes public. The danger is that it will go, go the danger is that it will go public in a populist way. It will go public in a way that sociologists, for example, try and maximize the number of readers of their books. It will be, it will, it will be, the danger is that the public sociologist panders to the lowest common denominator. That, and that is why the professional sociology has continually got to engage in a discussion with the public sociologist so that the public sociologist remains accountable to the professional sociologist. So what sociology goes out into the public is indeed the state of the art of sociology. But yes, that's what we have to do. And it doesn't mean that we downplay the professional. We have to accentuate the professional to make that possible. Yes, all right. Yes. Uh, I have also several questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is, um, how does uh, your uh, scheme, your outline the political field uh, reflect to the Weberian notion of um, researching the ways in which values constitute uh, this political change? Uh, and the, the second one is um, about the role Well, this scheme, the two by two table, is my view straight from Weber. Can we, can we go back to that two by two? Good. Basically, 
The distinction between instrumental and reflexive knowledge is nothing other than Weber's distinction uh, between instrumental and, and value rationality. And basically what Weber says is that we have to develop a sociology as science, but no science, no social science, social science can do without value foundations. So the critical sociology is in a sense essential to provide in a sense a continuing interrogation of those foundations. The distinction between fact and science is a real distinction, but facts, in a sense, or the science, requires the values, value orientation. So that's that dimension. Now, the academic, extra-academic, is, in my view, the science as a vocation and politics as a vocation. So the academic audience is all about science as a vocation, and the extra-academic is about politics as a vocation. Now, one thing that Max Weber did not have, however, was what? Public sociology. That's the fascinating thing. I think the scheme is totally Weberian. But he did not have that bottom right. Why? Because Max Weber had no confidence that the population, the lay population, the dominated classes, could engage in a conversation with sociologists. He had no conception of that conversation. He had no conception of a public sphere, which, you know, in part is a reflection of the time in which he was writing but a, also a part in which his own elitist perspectives vis-a-vis -vis mass society so infiltrated into his understanding of the relationship between science and politics. But the funny thing is this. The funny thing is this. The two famous essays, Science as a Vocation and Politics as a Vocation, brilliant essays, if you haven't read them, they are essential reading for all sociologists. Science of a, Do you know who they were? Those le they were lectures. Do you know who they were given to? They were given to students. There is Max Weber himself being a public sociologist. This is towards the end of his life, 1918-1919. Basically, it is towards the end of the... The first one was given towards the end of the war, and the second one was given after the war. The party later is totally pessimistic because it was after the Germans had been defeated in the First World War. But basically, this was an act of public sociology. He was engaging in the very practice of public sociology, so he had no concept of public sociology. And you could say that the Protestantism, the Spirit of Capitalism, probably the most widely read book in sociology, is a form of traditional public sociology, because it has informed so many debates. So he was a public sociologist, though he did not have a conceptual scheme to understand what he was doing as a public sociologist. So I think my scheme is very consistent with Max Weber, more so than with Durkheim or with Marx. Yeah, all right. Yes, now. The purpose of public sociology? In my view, the purpose of public sociology is to elevate the discussion about the direction in which society is moving. To elevate public discussion. To inform public discussion with sociological ideas. Ideas that link personal troubles to public issues. That's what I think public sociology is about. Yeah. Yes. But I think public sociology is also about invigorating professional sociology, transmitting new ideas into professional sociology from that engagement. That's how I see it. Now, other people may see it differently. Yeah. Am I still going on? Yep. Yes. I'm a bit surprised or puzzled that you emphasize specifically reflexive knowledge for public sociology. Uh, let's imagine a situation. We research uh, protest activity. We interview protesters. We uh, reach some conclusions about what makes protests successful or fail. And then we talk to the activists, you know, that's what I see is happening. And this is instrumental knowledge for them. And they might also uh, introduce some feedback saying, you know, we don't think you got this right, so uh, I changed my theory, and this is also instrumental knowledge because I explain how a protest may become successful or not. Uh, but this seems to be a public sociology, this kind of interaction right. with, with a protest movement, with right. protesters. Right. So how to fit right. it into the state? Well, I mean, the, the, you, you, as, you, as you formulated it, there's both a professional and a public moment. On the one hand, you okay. go in as a researcher, okay and you examine what are the conditions for successful protest, and you work with the pre-existing theories of protests, of which there are many in sociology. So you come up with an understanding that um, perhaps we have to understand protest as a result of 
uncertainty in life or something. And then you take that theory and you bring it into a conversation with the presumptions, with the presumptions of the protesters, if you will. Like the very, so action sociology, Turenne was the expert in this, or his, him and his students, the expert in this one. But I think that is a conversation between the results of your sociology and the community about which you have been theorizing. It's a conversation, two ways. A conversation about instrumental knowledge. Yes. About reflective yes. knowledge. Yes, it so is a conversation. Can be instrumental. No, no, but it's a conversation about instrumental knowledge. But first and foremost, it is a conversation. That's the important point about public sociology. It is not the sociologist saying, this is the truth, accept it or not. Well, of course, some, sometimes there is that vanguardist approach to public sociology. But no, it's more a matter of having a discussion and seeing, in a sense, what each side contributes to that discussion. So you bring your theory to the protesters, and they say, no, uncertainty was not the issue. The issue was, you know, this was an act of parliament, act of the legislature that we were protesting against. It's nothing to do with that. So we have a conversation. But it is about, you're right, it is about a, a conversation about instrumental knowledge, but it's a conversation that is important. It's, you're not do, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not a laboratory. It can be seen to be a laboratory from the professional sociologist's position. Some people would argue that when you have a result like this about conditions of protest, that one way of validating, invalidating it is to bring it to the public. But that is an extension of the professional sociology. It is not the public sociology as such, which focuses very much on, I think, conversation, a conversation about instrumental knowledge, about sociology. It's the conversation that is important to me. Yeah, hmm, not at all convinced. Okay. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> May I ask another question? Uh, how do you think uh, this uh, situation with public is it special for sociology or it's uh, common for physics, for ecology? Because in physics we have also what we call the popular physics. Where some physics they are writing the book for children, for uh, adult people. Uh, they just uh, writing about the modern advanced problems yeah. of physics, what will be the results, of the, blah, blah, blah. And the same situation uh, for ecology, now for biology. So it's something special or not? And the second very, I think, related question is, how do you think what is the best uh, person uh, for this public labor? Probably it's a good journalist, uh, who is very interested in sociology, but maybe also in economy, uh, also a little bit in politics, uh, in the ecological problem, uh, ethic problem, and so forth. So it's not for scientists, but for the good uh, public intellectuals. Uh, normally it's a little bit, uh, uh, so like a columnist, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. No, I think this scheme applies to any discipline. Any discipline. So, obviously the balance, for example, of instrumental and reflexive knowledge will be different. In physics, you know, the emphasis will be much more on the instrumental knowledge rather than the reflexive knowledge. So in the natural sciences, the emphasis is on the instrumental. I think in the humanities, the emphasis is on the reflexive. I think the social sciences are interesting because they try and combine both. Um, so, yes, you can map this for all disciplines. And I think increasingly that the natural scientists are aware of the public dimension of what they're doing. There is an increased consciousness about their public role, particularly as the state withdraws funding from universities. So they are increasingly aware that they have to justify what they are doing. And of course there have been huge debates in physics, like the struggles around the atomic bomb, for example. Very public. And today the environment is a big issue. And, and, and natural scientists have all sorts combined. And which comes to your second question, I think, what you're, one of the ideas in your second question is that perhaps a public engagement requires not one discipline but multiple disciplines. And indeed that is, in that, that is an occasion, public sociology or public social science or public scholarship is the occasion for collaboration between and among disciplines. Now you have a further question about who should be doing this and whether journalists should. Now that is a very interesting question. Of course, some professional sociologists say, you know, journalists shouldn't get involved at all. We have this credential and we should be the ones doing it. That is, of course, wrong. 
we should be building up a much closer relationship between ourselves as sociologists and journalists. And indeed, the best journalists are brilliant sociologists, whether they like it or not. Uh, and the thing is that we should try and educate journalists. So we should have special courses for journalism in sociology. We, it, they shouldn't be the enemy competing for public space, but they, we should be collaborating. Because they do, as you are implying, have special skills. And they have an overview. But I don't know how many of you here deal with journalists, but it can be very frustrating to deal with journalists. And you can spend hours and hours explaining things to journalists, and then they get it completely wrong, or they ignore what you say. I mean, and this, is, this is part and parcel of the project of public sociology, the patience and the diligence. So that's another reason why we should be working with journalists and having special courses for journalists about sociology, so that we'll be able to have a better conversation with them. Yeah, so I, I think that's, uh, and I think the other thing that I think is very important is that we should be engaging in public sociology as a collective. It is miserable to be doing this as an individual. And I think we have to have collectives of public sociology. Well, the spiel is actually, this is a collective. You know, it's not just one person doing this, this is a collective project. And I think it's very important for us to work together because we need to learn from one another, we need to be encouraged by one another because public sociology can be a very lonely, very frustrating experience. Because the public out there is instinctively not sociological in the sense that they don't see the macro world that is shaping their personal troubles. They tend to see the world through a very individualistic lens. And we're trying to look at things in a much more sociological, social, structural lens. There's a tension there. That struggle to convey that to broader publics requires, I think, a collective project rather than an individual project. So, yeah, that's a long answer to your question. Yes. Lena. Hi. Uh, thank you for inspiring the talk, Michael. My first question is uh, the following. Would you agree that it's not from the professional community of sociologists, but from funding bodies, including state or this state or economy, that this pragmatic demand for relevance comes. And I think pragmatic, what, demand, pragmatic for, demand for relevance, yeah. for usefulness. Yeah. You yeah, have yeah. to be useful, yeah, yeah. you have to present yourself as useful. Yeah. So there seems to be a very ambiguous situation that you have to think about to what extent you're useful, not because your consciousness was raised by people like yourself, but because you see that you, you, you constantly receive these external impulses to prove that you can bring some use, that you can be useful. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? It, yeah. Well, basically, yes. I mean, it's this instrumental knowledge that is emphasized increasingly in the world in which we live, which makes it all more important to emphasize the reflexive moments, to sustain the critical and the public. The danger is that the critical and the public gets pushed aside. So that's another reason why I am a campaign for public sociology, because precisely we're living in a world that is interested in immediate, immediate results, immediate consequences. And I am saying, um, as indeed the Frankfurt School said, as indeed Max Weber says, that we have to be, as academics, we have to be thinking not just in the immediate tomorrow, but in long term, where is our society going? Have discussions of a broader character. So that may, the fact that we are subject to these utilitarian pressures makes it all the more important for us to emphasize this reflexive moment. And so, yes. Yeah, and when it comes to reflexive moments, what do you think about uh, the fact that the professional community increasingly finds itself working in a very precarious co conditions. Think about flexibilization, short-term contracts, all these uh, new schemes of uh, inequality, to the extent that uh, many professionals, sociologists, social scientists, and people in humanities are on the verge of becoming protesters themselves, and this is as it will as it is well known, they actively participate in process, fighting for their cause, fighting for their interests, for instance, in the framework of Russian anarchy or Ukrainian anarchy. So they are, they are not teaching how to protest effectively. They themselves protest. Right. So does it fit into your skin? Yeah, no, I think that that's another part of the story, is that with the increased emphasis in the instrumental, the actual character of the university is being completely transformed. And in many ways, both pressures from the political and from the economic. 
and in different ways in different parts of the world, but it's all been transformed. So the question is, can we sustain the university as we know it? Well, we'll only sustain it with protest, but that protest, in a sense, what that protest, what I'm suggesting here is that the university or the academy has to build a, a constituency outside the academy. And if it's built up through protests, fine, but it has to build that constituency. I think what has happened, and this part of the world is perhaps exceptional, but in the, in the Western world, in a country like the United States, we have just automatically assumed that you know, we have university autonomy, that basically we can research what we want. We've been living in a fool's paradise, and it's over. It's over. And now we have to think about what a public university is. The idea of a public university is being destroyed in the United States, in, in, in England, and to a lesser extent in, 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 on, on the continent. And the question is, what is a public university today, given that increasingly it will be funded privately and through student fees? Well, we have to think about what that word public means. And I think it means that we have to be increasingly accountable to publics. You know, the idea of public university in the United States and to a extent in Europe is university that is free for all. Well, that, was, that is fine. That's just one moment of it. I think a public university is a university that is accountable to publics, that engages with discussions with publics, which is, of course, what public sociology is about. So I think that, um, that we have to, indeed, um, the danger is that we basically accommodate to these new pressures. We take on two jobs, three jobs, four jobs, if our salaries are being cut. Or, you know, then there's also what happens in, 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 in the United States, for example, and then a smaller and smaller elite. So tenure doesn't disappear, it's just smaller and smaller numbers, and the mass of teaching is done by lecturers. So, I mean, the, the elite actually is very happy to accommodate. Its conditions are getting better but at the expense of those groups. So we have to be engaged in a critical discussion within the university, about the university, and a public discussion with publics, what a university is. So these questions are we raised all the more urgently because of the changes in higher education across the planet. Across the planet. I'd love to, I'd love to stop. Thank you very much. Okay. Ah, <laughs> <laughs>